Hi there, this is the Senior Community Center Something to Talk About, which is sponsored by Fieldstone Communities of Bainbridge Island. Fieldstone offers memory care and independent living now, uh, just opening, and they are about to open assisted living units up on Rolling Bay in August. Uh, they also have day stay and respite programs. If you'd like to take a tour or find out about the uh, residences or any of the details, please call 360-594-1010. Tell them you heard about them here at uh, Something to Talk About. Also, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathering on the ancestral homeland of the Suquamish people, the people of the clear salt water. The Suquamish have lived on the waters of the Salish Sea since time immemorial. We honor them. We are grateful for their stewardship of these lands and waters and for their hospitality. It's time to talk about gardening. And boy, we've got uh, we've got summer right now, don't we? Anne Lovejoy is with us. And Anne, um, I'm going to ask you to unmute. And uh, we'll get started with uh, this month's installment of uh Water 101, 201, and 301. Or as the tomato turns. Yeah. <laughs> I think I get more questions about tomatoes than watering, but it's pretty neck and neck, actually. So yes, and obviously this hot, dry weather absolutely means watering is more important than ever. Interestingly, because we still are having the cooler nights and the um, a fair amount of wind, you know, the plants can be drying out even when they're moist, like the soil can be moist, but the wind can be drying the plants out. I've seen some wind burn on a few plants, especially down near the water. So if you have a home that's um, kind of on the coast, you might be seeing some of that. Uh, but yeah, it's something to really think about um, trying to water the soil and the roots and not the foliage. A really good idea in summer because wet foliage, really susceptible to diseases, especially when the, there's high humidity. Um, I know that a lot of people haven't really kind of figured out the difference between humidity and dew point, but here's the deal. It's like the dew point is the best indicator of um, humidity, right? And when the humidity is high and the dew point is high, which is like between 55 and 65, more or less, it feels muggy to us and pollen gets really sticky. And so the pollination drops um, a lot when the um, when the humidity goes up, right? It's kind of a thing. Um, but I've had a lot of questions about that. Like sometimes in the summer, it seems like it's warm, it's perfect weather, but the tomato tomatoes are not getting pollinated properly. Um, tomatoes are self fertile for the most part. They have both male and female parts. So, but they need a little help. And sometimes the wind is really helpful at like getting that pollen to shed. When the bees land. They do their wing thing and they're right at you know middle C, and that's the actual magic tone that releases pollen. So you get more pollen shed when the bees are busy. So the plant doesn't technically need them, but they do actually, um, they're more fruitful when they have visitors and not just bees, but other kinds of insects too. Um, but that's one of the problems that can come about here in the Northwest where we tend to have pretty high dew points. And so thus, you know, sticky muggy feeling, even though it's, you know, not maybe 89 or 100, like some places, right? That's just a thing. But kind of circling back to the water situation, uh, you know, a lot of people are watering daily. And that's probably a good idea if you're talking about containers and hanging baskets, because those can dry out really fast, especially smaller containers. Boom. They just sometimes you have to water two or three times a day. And I always think about putting them in a deep saucer um, so that they can be standing in water for a while and they will suck it all up. Now you don't want to leave them sitting in water. If they're not sucking it all up, that means they've got enough water in the, the whole root mass. And then you're going to get little mosquitoes or something like that. But mm -hmm. when you water, fill the saucer, check back, you know, maybe 20 minutes, half hour, and dump out any that is lingering. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't want mosquitoes. Thank you very much. Um, but watering from the bottom is a really good idea, for, especially for larger containers, because frequent shallow watering is just gonna like irrigate the top couple inches. And sometimes in those big containers, if you start digging down, you'll find out that it's totally bone dry about four inches down. And so you've got a lot of shallow roots and that means a much more vulnerable plant that's not as resilient. Mm -hmm. So watering from the bottom, really good idea. 
I used to use a big turkey baster sometimes to um, pull out the excess water and then you can squirt it out on somebody else or your grandkids or whoever's around, right? <laughs> Fun with turkey basters, we can all have that. Um, <laughs> And so, uh, and so for plants that are in the ground, uh, I know you su you suggested a couple of things in the past. Well, yeah. Then the thing is, what kind of soil do you have? Because around here, we usually have mostly heavy clay, which holds a lot of water. And you got to remember that plant roots really need oxygen too, as much as water. And so, we drowned more plants um, by excess watering than um, lose them to drought. And I mean, unless you're not watering at all. But you have to be really a bit sensitive about what kind of soil you have and how often you need to water. If you happen to have sandy soil, and there are some areas in, uh, in Bainbridge and on Kitsap where you do have kind of loose, lighter, sandy soil, then you have to watch that because it can go uh, dry off really quickly, of course, drain away very freely. Mm -hmm. So you can use one of those little moisture meters, you know, the, and if you buy one, get one with a long stem, not just like a four, three inch, but one of those ones with a even 10 or 12 inch stem so that when you put it in, you can put it deeper into the pot and then you'll get a better and put it in several places. One thing too, when you're watering containers, always remember to water the rim, the inner rim first, and then go to the center and then go back to the rim again. Because one of the things that happens with hanging baskets, color bowls, big containers, is the soil, as the soil dries out, it shrinks. And so you have this little gap around the edge around the rim and that's and then the water just runs right down sits in your saucer and you think oh it's fine it's full well no it isn't so you, that's something to really watch and that's why your moisture meter will help you and also filling that saucer waiting for it to upload <laughs> and then making sure that it's not too much that will be really useful hand watering is tricky everybody kind of loves to do it because it feels like you're nurturing your garden and there is a point to it like you're at least looking at the garden right you're not just hooking it up to an irrigation system and assuming all is well. Um, but the thing is, it's really not easy to water effectively, water deeply. Mm -hmm. One thing you can do is get one of those hose bubblers at the end that just, um, it, it, it doesn't spray like crazy. It just bubbles out and you can have that somewhere and you can do a little weeding, okay. set a timer on your watch mm -hmm. or your, you know, whatever. And then every five oh, minutes or so, move it mm -hmm. to another place. Right. And that way you'll get deeper water than you would if you're not going to stand there for this five minutes. This is not on yeah. Facebook. Oh, if you're looking to sign up for a mm -hmm. I've, I've count to 10 a few times, but that's that's not exactly five minutes. It's not. And, and you know, are you doing one hippopotamus, two yeah. hippopotamus, right? <laughs> 10. Yeah, it's, you know, it's tedious, basically, unless you're super meditative, in which case you're probably there for an hour and a half. And that's too much. <laughs> right? You can tell if plants have been overwatered because the leaves will start to be yellow. And the thing that's kind of tricky about them is they'll um they'll fall off really easily. And it's usually like the middle of the plant and the bottom of the plant where the leaves go yellow first. That's a sign that they're being overwatered. And if they just fall right off when you touch them, that's overwater. If they don't and they're in other places, it's probably a, like some kind of mineral deficiency or nutrition deficiency and you might want to give them an extra boost um a little fertilizer and again i like to mix liquid seaweed like kelp liquid uh, like i take a gallon of water and about up to a quarter cup of the kelp stuff liquid kelp um, or at least a couple tablespoons and a tablespoon or so of humic acid liquid humic acid and then you can add fish fertilizer or whatever you want to that um, to the suggested rate on whatever package you have for a gallon and you slish it all up and then you, I give plants like a half cup of that for a big tomato every couple of weeks say till about the middle of August or the end of August and then you don't want to be fertilizing those kinds of plants anymore but for now they could use it a midsummer refresher right anybody what got is humic acid, acid? Sorry? What is humic acid? What is, the is question. humic acid? Oh, okay. So humic acid is one of the components of compost, right? And it's not a fertilizer per se, but it is a soil builder. It is a soil it, a texture enhancer. So it mm -hmm. helps create that open soil texture that allows air to the roots as well as water and makes soil drain better. Really important for heavy clay soils because it's like a soil opener, right? And again, it's not a fertilizer as such, but it really does make a difference to the way um, 
plant roots are able to access deeper nutrients. Does that make sense? And so it's sort of like the concentrate of compost. Oh, is it crystalline? It's is liquid. it a I've only ever bought it as a liquid. Oh. Um, but yeah, you can get you can get humic acid as granules too. I mean, I usually put that down like in spring and in fall, right before I put another layer of compost on as a little milk feeding mulch. Um, but yeah, you can buy bags of of granulated humic acid or bottles of liquid humic acid, right? Will, and it, will it oh, help go to ahead. Be, um, adjust my soil pH to a lower pH? A little, yeah, but um, compost is generally pretty buffering. And so that will help make it more neutral, which is what a lot of vegetables like and a lot of fruit likes, yeah. right? So yeah, that's a good way to do yeah. that. And and real, you know, compost itself Remember, is most buffering. Like, we think that my soil is getting we, I know it's a little bit basic, 7.5, and we think it's getting that from the leaching from the block wall that I have yeah. for my raised bed and behind my bed. So I'm back into that. Thank you. Yeah, compost will help buffer that. It'll buff right out. <laughs> That'll buff right out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, that's so. When we're talking about um, those those bubblers, that sounds like a good way to, to water in your when you're out there weeding and doing yard work. And you're saying about five minutes generally before you move it. Yeah, I mean, that's usually, especially if you're gonna do it a couple times a week. Um, and you can tell, you know, the plants that are getting enough water don't look dire. You know, they don't look super stressed. A lot of established perennials, especially if you've been tr working to try to create a palette of more um, drought resistant perennials, a lot of them will not need a lot of okay, water, got it. Huh? but okay. they will need you know, probably weekly or at least every couple of weeks, especially with this hot, you know, it's been really hot and dry. Um, and like I said, the wind also sucks moisture. So that's kind of an extra whammy and can burn the foliage if it's dry. Um, so making sure the water's going down, not up. We don't want it on the on the flowers and we don't want it on the leaves. Some people have said, shouldn't I dust, you know, rinse the dust off? Yeah, you can do that. Um, the thing about watering the leaves in the daytime is it, it, so water will magnify sun so they can get burned. The leaves can burn if they're wet and with a lot of direct sunlight. So if you're gonna do that rinsing thing, you could do it early in the morning, rinse the, plant, the leaves off. If they're really dusty in some driveways and stuff, sometimes they are. Um, and that way the plants will have a chance to dry out in the early morning sun, which isn't as hot and uh, not as burny as the afternoon sun. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. All right. I wanted um, to talk a little about oh. um, summer pruning of fruit trees too, because I've had a lot of questions about that. People are saying, no, you're supposed to prune in winter. It's like, well, here's the deal. Pruning in winter encourages growth. That's to make something grow bigger, stronger, right? It's never ever gonna help your plants stay smaller. Um, that's just not the way that works hormonally speaking. But summer pruning is all about size control. So if you have not just fruit trees, but really all kinds of things, um, it's actually a good time to be pruning away plant excess growth on things that you don't want to get too tall. Now that's not going to work indefinitely on a plant that's actually nature wants it to be 80 feet. You're going to have that chainsaw relationship forever if you try to keep it to 10, right? But we're talking about like maybe Japanese maples or some of the smaller trees of larger shrubs. Set, certainly for fruit trees, um, you want to be thinking about pruning them around the solstice into right about now, still a really good time. And you take off all the suckers at, from the base, you cut them right to the bone. And if the cherries often have suckers all along the roots, you'll see them coming up in the lawn and all over the place. Take all those suckers off right to the very bottom. and um, use like the flat of the pruner right against the nub of where it's coming off so that you can really get them all. And then any water shoots that are straight up, we've talked about that, like take those water shoots off all the way clean. And any hangers, like a lot of times you'll have the branch and there'll be a, a curving branch that comes down and weights the plant down. Well, if you cut that off, it will lift. And then you're lifting the skirt without having to remove whole branches, right? You take the heavy water shoots off, you take the hangers off, 
boom, it starts to kind of rise up and give you a, nice, a much nicer um, silhouette, right? We should all enjoy a nicer silhouette. That's right. We we want that. But of course, we're looking at all that fruit that's on that tree right now, right? It's starting. It's like that's the hardest thing for people to get. It's like summer pruning. Oh my God! Sometimes you're cutting off fruit. But the thing you have to remember is it's gonna fall off anyway. Like a lot of trees are shedding fruit because it's dry, right? They know they can't carry that many apples or pears or whatever it is, so they're just dropping them like all the time. And so a lot of people thin their fruit, which if you have pruned your little tree to be a small tree, that works pretty well, right? You can reach up and, and keep it the size you want and you can reach the fruit and take off um, the excess, like where there's a cluster, thin it to one, right? It makes them less target for like coddling moths and stuff like that anyway whole cluster often you'll get little worms and stuff inside between those lovely enticing spaces are just homey right you don't want that so each having each fruit sort of stand alone means they'll be larger riper um ripen better and probably more flavorful too uh, but shedding fruit is tough on people because they freak out it's like oh i lost all my apples so it's like yeah but do you really want 600 apples or do you really want like 80 to 100 really nice ones and of course, all the best ones are on top. They get the light, the air, the great air circulation. Um, and so that's another reason to keep your trees on the smaller side. And there's a wonderful book, um, where did I put it? That the library has five copies of this, right? It's called, right? Grow a little fruit tree. And uh, it's really very clear. It's very simple in a lot of ways, lots of good illustrations. It's out of California, so some of it's not quite the same, but um, but there's a lot of tips in it that will work really well for Bainbridge and Kitsap um, with our kind of sort of foggy mornings and stuff. She talks a lot about that. So I really like that book, and I think it's a, it's a good incentive for people to think about having more small trees and fewer big ones in a backyard orchard you could have a really lot of variety, which is so fun. And not instead of one big gnarly old tree that's always got diseases, has been <laughs> sick for years, you know, drops all its leaves, has wormy fruit. It's like, yeah or no, you know, you don't have to, you're not stuck with that. You're allowed to make, make a change. So I am circling back to watering a little bit because you've mentioned before that, um, Although we never think about watering trees, that uh, in a, as we get drier and drier, certainly for some of our trees, we need to think yeah. about that. It's really true. And so fruit trees are definitely one that you probably do want to think about watering. And again, for all of these trees, their drip line is where most of their active feeder roots are, not right up against their trunk. So you look at where the water, the rain would fall off the edge of the tree, right? That drip, that's the drip line of a tree. And that's where the active feeder roots are in a, in a strip that's about two to three feet wide with that drip line in the center. So it's going around the tree in whatever shape it is. It's not usually a perfect circle, but you know, something. That's where your um, compost mulch goes. That's where you wanna have um, the, the water directed and not just like all over the place, right? So that can be a little tricky because you then you have that bubbler thing where you're moving it around to say, say four or five positions for that tree once or twice a month in weather like this. Now we did have a cloudburst this week. I don't know if anyone noticed that. I think it was Monday. Um, we had a really lovely hard rain for about 30 seconds, but it was amazingly refreshing. <laughs> I saw the neighbor kids running around going, Woo! right? It was great. Um, yeah, I got I get to I got to call out my vocabulary word of petrochlor. Oh, there you go, right. The scent this, this, of fresh rain, right? It's the warm, the scent of the rain hitting the earth, what the earth releases. And it's kind of a compost smell, really. It's kind of cool. Yes. Um, so we what was the, what was the word? Can you spell it, Reed? Okay, what, now, now, now I have to spell Reed? it. Petrochlor, I think it's P-E-T-R-I-C-H-L-O-R, something like that. Not that, I don't think. Let's see. Okay, well, I can ask the Petrochlor. internet. You know, I always... Uh, I, know. But that... I think it's... I think it's, it's C-H-O-R. P-E-T-R-I-C-H-O-R. Yes. 
and I'm discovering that you can buy a candle with petrichor scent. Well, who knew? Um, <laughs> so anyway, the point is, that's a very refreshing moment for people and plants, but it's pretty brief. And in our climate, which is modified Mediterranean, we do not typically get a lot of rain through from May to October. And that can be very stressful for even native plants, especially when we've had relatively dry winters, which we have. And Washington is still in a state of, it's, we're in a drought state, but not in a, uh, what is that second rating? It's like, it's not a deep drought. It's still a drought. So even native, if trees will benefit from some soaking. Um, a soaker hose put around the drip line of a large tree would really be helpful. Um, once a month maybe, right? You don't have to do it every day, but um, making sure there's, uh, that they have something to go on, right? Even our native plants that are pretty accustomed to dry summers are accustomed to wet winters. And when they don't get that, the dry summers are a lot harder to handle. And did you have another comment? So are you including like yes, yes. Um, so are you including like mature gigantic um cedar and spruce in you this know, uh yeah? Tool? I don't know if you've noticed, but especially last year, if you drove along 305, you would see big leaf maples covered in mildew from dry root. You would see cedars shedding way more just, than usual. Their red tags falling down, much much more uh, leaf drop right. than than usual. Um, and you would see small plants, small cedars, and small firs just turning brown and dying. Um, so yeah, you know, if you have a little forest, yeah, yeah, you might want to spring for a, a, a soaker hose and do a little take turns, give everybody a turn, right? Uh, yeah. Wow. I never used to say that. In fact, we used to say, don't do that because they're not adapted to it and they'll, you know, it gives them root rots and everything else. But anymore, that's not true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of climate on the move as we as we know. And uh, we don't we don't know exactly how it's going to play out. We have lots of forecasts. Anita, did you have a comment? I had a question, too, about watering. Um, as as you, as I've said, I I have a little balcony with you know my one tomato plant and and some um, Johnny jump ups and I'm going into Seattle so I you know I'll probably not be able to water the in the morning should I should I put my tomato plant in a saucer of water or should I try to move it out of the sunshine so it doesn't quite bake like it usually does or what would you advise? For how long are you going to be gone? Um, mostly, I think just overnight. I think I think I'll leave, you know, tomorrow and probably be back Friday evening. Yeah, I mean, the, it's that west western afternoon mm -hmm. sun that's the hardest. So and if you can yeah. even hang like a little sheet or some shade cloth, you know, buy a package of shade cloth and just hang some up so that those plants get shade in the afternoon. You can hang it on the west side of the balcony or something. Um, that would be helpful. And of course, water them well before you go. And the little pots, if you, you know, you were saying before that those Johnny jump ups are in small pots that dry out really fast. You can actually put them in the sink with a few inches of water. You know, I thought about that and, and they're, they're on the, you know, they're kind of on the end of their life, I think. And I noticed that the leaves are kind of powdery. I don't know if it's powdery mildew that's forming, you know, cause I, well, anyway. I, and I, I have done that, put them in the sink and that worked, but now I was a little hesitant to bring them in the apartment. I didn't want anything to spread to my house plants. Yeah, because that powdery mildew is, it sounds like probably what that is, but you could have like a, um, how many pots do you have? A Just little oh, three, three. Yeah, so get one of those, you know, a plastic washing tub. Or probably not, I or can, I can like improvise that. something, I'm sure. Yeah. And just have them in that for a while. And you can also cut them back Give them a little bit of like a liquid fertilizer, like fish fertilizer or something like that. Mm -hmm. Have Make that. Sure they're very moist and they'll probably rejuvenate and do give you a whole nother crop. Oh, oh, okay. That would be great. You know what I've been doing? This is on the side, but I've been cutting off the blooms and, and then um, washing them with egg white and powdered sugar. 
and I have I have a whole jar of of little Johnny jump ups to put oh. on muffins and cupcakes oh. and things. I see. I thought you meant on the plant, but you mean you've picked the flowers off and then candy them. Yes. Yep. Okay. Because I was like, <laughs> oh, I wouldn't put sugar on a plant outside. You're going to call every <laughs> aphid in the I guess I didn't it. describe it well, but yeah. I've just been <laughs> no, she's, she's not going to call the aphids, just every grandchild. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, then that is fun. I mean, you can do that with things like rose petals and lavender mm -hmm. too, right? Okay. This is a fun time to do that. I'm just yeah. getting ready. My grandkids are here. We're going to make um, rosemary salt, rosemary garlic salt. Go okay. out and pick some rosemary and grind it up with um, nice. I don't use sea salt anymore because unfortunately there's so much plastic in it. But um, the mined salt, like the diamond crystal, is um, doesn't have plastic in it. And we grind it up with a bunch of with like a whole cup full, cup for cup cup of rosemary and, and chopped garlic and a cup of that salt or maybe two depends and then grind it up and bake it off in a shallow you know rimmed baking sheet at 225 for about 20 15 or 20 minutes and it will turn sort of yellow and go crunchy or greenish and crunchy and i put it back in the in the grind in the food processor and grind it up again and now it's shelf stable and it will be delicious and you can do that with all, an herbal mix you can do it with basil you can do it with you know fennel anything you like mm. and those are like 12 bucks a pop for those little jars and you yeah. for about 25 cents um, okay. Great gifts. yeah and i also would really appreciate sometime soon getting your recipe for the calendula um uh bomb that you oh, yeah made. that's My really easy skin problems and i was telling her how that is so helpful to you and yeah um, so I, yeah, and I'll have to find a source for the calendula. It's not a, it's not a difficult, I use, I get um, about a quart of the petals. When the calendulas are fading, they start to close up instead of being like that, they kind of get close and you can just pull them off. They're a little bit sticky. And I put them in an open container so they can dry out, not mold, right? Mm -hmm. And you, when you get about a quart of uh, petals like that, you can put them in a slow crock pot on low <laughs> with about a quart of organic coconut oil and you steep them for about three to four hours and then strain it through cheesecloth and it will um, just turn sort of golden. It has a nice light fragrance and I'm, it's great. I have rosacea, so I put it on my face at least twice a day. My granddaughter had chillblains and we put it on her wrists and it healed up when the medicine didn't, right? It, but the calendula gel did. Um, it's it's very soothing and gentle, but it's really effective. Thank thank you. And that's a dead easy. I mean, you know, there's not it's hard to go wrong, right? <laughs> you okay. can pick the calendula anytime you're walking by my house, Anita. Yeah, oh, you, or the ones you, abundance. We yeah, have we so have. much at the senior center. You are welcome. To, I know a couple people are harvesting, but there's so much you can take calendula, and then when you pull the petals off. You can also just pinch the head off and then it won't go to put all its energy into making seed. It will actually make more flowers and they keep blooming all through the year. Okay. Okay. Is that also a good plant for my balcony? Sure. Yeah. Okay. They're just, um, they're just really solid, strong doers. Okay. I've got some uh, yellow and some orange ones. Okay, those, well, those are probably the most popular or most uh, prolific. Most common. In my pea patch, I have some that are called cafe au lait that are slightly uh, caramel colored and they have a little bit of sort of golden brown in the center and a little sort of rusty colored. Some of them are almost rust cinnamon colored. <laughs> Fancy. Fancy. Reed, if, you see, if you see somebody in your front yard, Reed, picking your calendula, oh, <laughs> tell, tell your family you gave her permission. I will. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Are there any other questions or comments for Anne? I was going to just talk a little about pruning tomatoes because several people have asked about that who probably will watch this later. Um, the indeterminate tomatoes are the ones that don't quit. They just keep getting longer and their arms go up and they go on forever. So that's all well and good, but then they start getting really leafy and then the fruit is sort of covered with foliage and it's hard to get them to ripen as well. So you wanna, and, and by about, I'd say in another month or so, you wanna 
start really cutting the ends off in the bottom. Any fruit that really starts up in the middle to, to late August is probably not gonna actually make it, tomatoes. So that will be a time to um, start pinching off the flowers and ex explaining to the plant that its job is now to ripen what it has. Like be happy with what you have and make those come um, get nice, right? But for now, um, there's if it's a very leafy plant, you might want to carefully thin. Now, one of the things that can happen, again, that west afternoon sun can be hard on the tomatoes and you might get some sun scald, which looks like white or yellow, um, the, almost like a burn mark on the skin. It doesn't affect the flavor. It doesn't affect the, the quality of the fruit, but it does make it look funky. So that's something to um, just kind of be awake to that when you do the pruning, don't get too wild. It's not a buzz cut it's kind of a little page boy bob, right? We want to leave enough, uh, and especially on that southwest side, I'd be, I'd be apt to leave a little more and take a little more off the east uh, and north sides because that light is not as, as harsh on a plant. Also, there's, um, I've been having given questions about early blight and blossom end rot. Uh, two things that really help with that are, um, coffee grounds, used coffee grounds, mulching with about a half an inch to an inch um, will actually <laughs> prevent quite a few, weirdly enough, it's very effective against some of the um, foliage diseases. And also worm castings can help with some of those, um, like you can buy worm castings or if you have a worm bin, that's what you get when you, ch you know, they use up all the food and soil and you change it out and you give them more stuff to eat and then you take those worm castings and you can mulch with those and that really cleans up a lot of things even aphids which is kind of amazing um just a good way to kind of preventive hygiene for your plants yeah that's good and the, the suggestion about uh, when we get later on pinching off those flowers to keep the tomato focused on what you would like it to do yeah, it's hard. I know it's like when I tell people to thin fruit and they start to cry, my apples. But it's like, you know, you have to be, it's tough love. Um, it can only really do so much and we're asking it to do a lot. And so you want to actually make sure that you're um, only being realistic about how many, how many fruits a, a young plant especially can carry um, and how many you're going to actually use anyhow. That kind of minimizes the drops situation because that when you have a lot of dropped fruit, that's the first fruit to spoil. And that's where a lot of spores of diseases over, you know, get excited and move in. And that's also where raccoons and birds start coming in, which have their own issues. Um, so those things can go in a hot compost pile or in the green waste cart, but I don't leave them around because they're not really, um, not hygienic. Well, Anne, I want to thank you very much for taking the time and uh, sharing all this information. And I know that uh, we all appreciate it and the folks who are watching it later appreciate it too. And I'll encourage, uh, there's a link down in the video when we have that up on YouTube to your blog, there you uh, go. Green Gardening, uh, where you at least, well, several times a month, drop, drop a few lines for our enjoyment. Thank you for that.